Lindsay, this is producer Kara. I believe you have muted yourself. Oh, okay. I can I cannot hear you. Guess, can you hear? It says guess has muted themselves. Can't hear you, Lindsay. We cannot hear you. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to the Agronomist, which is live. Lindsay, can the rest of you guys see Lindsay? I can see her. I can see her. I can't hear her. Yeah, I, I can we see can, her. We can see you, Lindsay. We just can't hear you. It says. Uh, guess Thanks, Bell Media. Has muted itself. Okay. Lindsay, you might have to leave and come back for a second here. Okay, welcome everyone to the Agronomist. As always, great to uh, have you along for the ride. This is producer Kara Oosterhouse here right now. Uh, we are here for a great show. It's going to be a good one, but uh, yeah, just stay tuned as we solve a couple quick technical difficulties here. And Lindsay is back it looks like so Lindsay, i think i'm here there you are great yes it kept telling me i was in the green room and the host could not see me or hear me and apparently neither could anyone else but i'm here now so thank you kara yes producer kara is here uh jay is on holidays i was on holidays last week so even though we only missed one week and and last week was the holidays uh or the holiday it feels like uh, it has been weeks since we did this. And uh, so, you know what? We'll, <laughs> we'll dust off uh, the cobwebs and we'll get this going. Uh, hello, Warren. And if you, so Warren is in my area of Ontario today and much of yesterday, it poured. So not only did uh, we have a few hiccups trying to get ready for this program tonight, uh, my, I lost Wi-Fi, I lost power. So yeah, it's an adventure. Live is an adventure. Okay, so welcome everyone here. Uh, welcome to Ray DeBanco, Jason Boat, who's uh, watching from Manitoba, and Ray is out in Calgary. Um, Warren, did you not did you not get a whole bunch of rain? Anyway, we got a ton. Um, I don't want to brag. We actually have too much. Okay, but tonight it is the Ergonomist. We are back. It's August eighth. Uh, Kara is our producer for tonight. We've got two great guests. We're going to talk about swath timing of canola and, of course, uh, harvest um, or pre-harvest scouting because there's some really cool things we can learn about our canola crop at harvest time. Uh, quickly, though, remember that you, if uh, you do collect CU credits, you can head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow and collect those CEU credits. Um, and, uh, yeah, Warren says they only got nine millimeters. Yeah, well, I apparently stole all your water because we got all of it okay uh before before i bring in our guests i do of course want to say a big thank you to our show sponsors to mind your farm business to canola school and of course to adama canada Oh, while other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. We did it. We, we are here. I made it. You can hear me. Let's bring in our guests, Sean Sanko and Doug Moisey. This is just how this evening is going to go. And Sean, you're like a cat in a sunbeam. So Sean, Sean, I'll start with you. Uh, where are you uh, recording from today? It looks like a cabin. So are you on holidays and you decided to no, do this? No, no, no. It's the only room with air conditioning here. So I'm going uh, <laughs> to put myself in to try and stay cool. It's really hot out. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that was us two days ago uh, here in the east. We were under a heat warning. Uh, Sean, remind everybody, where are you based? You're near Saskatoon? I'm based on Saskatoon. I, um, my territory is uh, south, central, south, south central Saskatchewan. Okay. And where, where are we at with the canola crop right now? How's it looking uh, stage-wise? It varies quite a bit from the south to the north of mine, so um, there's probably some when you get right down southern Saskatchewan that wouldn't be that far off, you know, another week, 10 days, um, all the way to, you know, you start going east and it's going to be a while. Like it's, um, 
you know, probably into mid September. So I'd say we need no frost for some of that. So this. Okay, we'll put in our order now for frost at Thanksgiving, and see see how we do. All right, and of course Doug joining us from the the man cave. Uh, Doug, whereabouts yep. are you based? Uh, Malaga, Alberta, just northeastern Alberta, north just north of St. Paul. So. And I cover uh, basically Provost across to Pinoca and then up towards Marathorpe and then back, sort of big territory. Yep, and, and where's the crop at where you are? It's varying. Uh, most of it has been out of flower since about the beginning of last week. Uh, we still got a few late seeded crops that are full bloom. Uh, these were on the later seeds. Some, some guys actually did some reseeding, but some guys were just late to the game. But this ongoing heat coming up here pretty soon is going to help us out here. But uh, it, we're all over the map. It, it, it's There's some really nice fields that I was in this afternoon that probably 15, 16 days, the guys better get close to watching what they're doing. So, so what then is contributing now? I'm going to guess uh, for many of you, you've got pretty large territories um and so i'm going to guess we've got excessive uh water in some of your area sean that that's put stuff behind doug is that the same for you but sean i'll start with you what has sort of put the crop in such a sort of staginess within your territories yeah once you get used to stuff doing um the farther you go the the wetter it was this spring so that's really pushed everything backwards you know that right as we roll into manitoba so that's what um, would make the crop late in, in most of those areas. Um, in our area, Lindsay, mm -hmm. it was a combination. Okay, Dad, what about it wasn't you? Really, um, so in most of the territory, we had actually decent moisture, but what actually really delayed the emergence was the heavy winds this spring, uh, lack of moisture. We had a lot of crops that had variable emerge just because of uh, soils just drying out in spots. One thing we saw on a couple of fields uh, where guys, the packing pressure wasn't quite set properly and you could see actually 10 plants come up and six still not germinated and they're in, they're in dry soil. So uh, we had a lot of areas like that. And then some guys had some pretty good areas on the heavier soils that we had some pretty good emergence and because we never saw rain until June. So most of our unevenness is from the fact of soils and how dry they were and we didn't really have much runoff, surprisingly, for the amount of snow we had, but there was not much runoff going on in my area. Hmm. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to try my best here. My connection, for some reason, is cutting out. Um, again, it has been a challenge today on the technical front. Uh, but, Doug, interesting point there about the the quality of sort of the seeding job having such an incredible impact on the staginess of the crop and on the emergence. Yeah, and you know, I'm not picking on any manufacturers or anything else, but there was some differences out there where we could see certain seeding tools doing better jobs. Now, is that a function of the operator? I still believe that the best stand establishment occurs at three feet, which is the distance from the front of the steering wheel to the back of the seat. But um, you could see some visible differences with certain seeding tools. And we did get into some spots where guys chase moisture, uh, it, maybe a little bit of dust storm. So a lot of little factors playing into the emergence. Um, you know, it, it's it's just the way the soils, soils played a big role. And the fact that we really had no humidity this spring. You know, typically you need some humidity to germinate the seed as well on top of soil moisture. but. We had dry conditions, and the one thing we noticed is there are a lot of days there where the winds are 20, 30 miles an hour. Well, if you didn't do a good job of packing that seed row down and getting it pressed, you were having some issues. And I think a lot of guys either were not paying attention to it or because they were in a rush, but I think also you get a little bit scared is that you pack it too much, you're going to have emergency issues from the crusting end of it, especially if you get a rain. So it's this billy be do billy be dam type of attitude, but that's where we saw a lot of the early differences as far as emergence was going. Now, Sean, uh, we certainly we heard from one of your colleagues uh, earlier this season, uh, Warren Ward, and at that point we were talking about uh, spreading canola on, 
maybe blowing it on, harrowing it in. Have you seen what some of those fields have look like now? Myself, I haven't, because that would be farther east. Um, you know, most of it in my territory, we were dry enough to, to get it in. But um, yeah, no, I haven't, um, personally, I haven't been through any of those fields that were actually um, floated or blown on. Okay, we'll get Warren to send some pictures. He was not a big fan. He was not a proponent yeah. of doing that. <laughs> Um, yeah, it is not it is not uh, a best management practice, but you do what you got to do. Um, yeah, Jason says, wait, what? Explain this this three feet thing, right? So yes, uh, operator error only accounts for so much. Um, certainly, different tillage or different seating tools in different conditions uh, are definitely going to make a difference. So um, yeah, uh, Kara says, our, okay, our question chart. Yeah, so the there it, there does seem to be Kara, producer Kara, a bit of a delay in comments coming in. Um, so uh, just everyone bear with me though, but if you've got any questions, comments for our guests, uh, by all means, uh, get them in here. So one of the reasons, of course, that uh, we talk about establishment and we talk about where the crop is at is for this all important swath timing and or straight cut, which we can talk about a little bit as well. Um, but let, let's start with Sean, in your area, what would be the split, do you think, straight cut versus swathed for harvest? It's tough to put an exact number on. I mean, straight cutting was really climbing, um, you know, for a few years there. Um, you know, just been on some tours and asking the question. And, you know, by a show of hands, I'd say it's, you know, maybe two thirds straight cut one third swath, but that's, like I say, it, um, it, and it seems to vary a bit. Uh, some producers still do both, you know, for timing reasons or depending what the season holds. So, um, it can be a mix. Yeah. Doug, about, what about in your area? Is it gaining momentum to straight cut? Well, it, it's, it's gaining in momentum. It? it is gaining some momentum in areas. It's a really mixed bag. Right now, I'd say it's probably 50-50, but it depends upon the geography. If you start getting in north of Highway 16, there are some core straight cut guys, but there's a lot of guys that swath. Uh, it all depends upon crop to anchor to, what the drying conditions, their harvest management manpower. Like For some guys, the reason why they have switching over to straight cut is the fact is they cannot get hired men to run a swath or while they're doing other things, like pre-harvest. So... Um, and then you get into geographies like Irma, Wainwright, across into there. And guys are always worried about a little September storms. So as long as the crop gets well knitted, the guys will actually take a chance on straight cutting or have gone to that. But you get into certain geographies, they still like the swathing. And the reason is, is that it does theoretically speed up the process where they knock it down, they can get going. And, you know, some guys are actually split. Uh, one customer of ours and one guy that I know of, he's 50% straight cut and 50% swath. And it's just all because of a harvest management. He can get going a little bit earlier and away he goes. Um, it is picking up more momentum. The last couple of years, there's been some areas in southern Saskatchewan, southern Alberta, where we've seen paw drop, uh, shelling. So guys are kind of now a little bit shy. And so they've kind of backed off. But typically in the area that I'm running, running uh, in central Alberta here, we, you know, that's not, has been not a big issue touch wood, but uh, at the end of the day is that guys are doing that as long as they're disease free and they have a relatively even crop. Mm -hmm. There's okay. So Doug, you make it sound so easy, but to me, I just picked up like six different possible combinations you could have there and all <laughs> the things that you're thinking about, which is why we're having these conversations. So, uh, because it isn't just as simple as, oh, we'll do those acres swath and we'll do these acres straight yeah. cut and that's how it's going to be. I mean, you have to have some flexibility, right? In A, having that plan, but then B, you know, dealing with what the season throws at you. So, so Sean, I'll, I'll ask you, or, or sorry, Doug, go ahead. And then I got a question here for well, Sean along those lines. I was just going to finish off saying that the straight cut decision shouldn't be actually made till the day you're ready to pull out the swather. So uh, we have a lot of guys that are on a straight cut. They will go out to straight cut, but they make that actual decision on August the 25th when they're looking at the crop. And then they'll make that decision. Is this a good enough candidate for straight cutting or do I have to pull out the swather? And that's, everybody can have an intention to straight cut on May the 5th, mm -hmm. but will you be able to do it on August? And so that's where, to me, it's all part of this harvest management is that what can you actually do on that day 
Because if you've got full of disease or you're full of weeds or you've got a bunch of other little things going on, straight cutting may not be the answer for you. So, you know, it's that game day decision. And I know it's pie in the sky. Ideally, yeah, June, May 1st, we're doing it. But it's still a game time decision. Now, okay, so, so Sean, but that building off that, of course, you've made the decision on what variety you're going to seed months before. Some of them, I mean, we know we have some traits here for pod shatter and those sorts of things. So some varieties are going to be, uh, are going to lend themselves to that straight cutting option. But, but following up sort of where Doug's coming from, how much planning should go into if you, if you are doing less swathing or want to do less, how much planning happens earlier in the season before that crop even goes in? Yeah, I mean, some of it is, um, you know, just making sure you've got the right variety. And um, I don't know if we got the, the slide I had um, just this last year. We produced WCCRC, uh, a rating system from one to nine on on pod shatter. So just helping with that decision. So if you know you're going to be straight cutting, um, you know, choosing a variety that will stand up to the harsher conditions and you can you can let stand up longer. So, um, All right. Yeah, that, that'd be your Pro first, first decision. Okay. Producer Kara, do we have that? Did sorry, did you say we have a slide of that, Sean? I was off last yeah, week. We, and I'll ad, I'll admit to everyone watching that I didn't check any of the slides before tonight's episode. Um okay, so there so we have a there is a rating system for straight cutting. Is that that the idea? Yes, it, it's been adopted by some of the companies. It's a voluntary rating system, but um okay. it's uh yeah, it's one to nine and so we're hoping to see it in more and more and more products that yeah, right there. So there we um, go. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. So like anything uh, from a one to a four, uh, one being the, the most or the least shatter um, resistant would be, you know, more prone to or more advised for swathing. So anything up to a four is kind of, you know, what we consider a swath variety and anything above that, um, you know, just keeps showing more and more degree of shatter resistance. So, you know, if you've got multiple varieties, you've got a, you know, a five and a seven, it also helps you choose, you know, which one, if it's going to stand out, you know, which one can I maybe leave a little longer if I need to. Right. So, and and that, of course, comes into that decision, of course, of, of if you've got a lot of acres to cover in and you've got, so you may want to use different varieties. Sean, should we get into the why you might want to have different varieties anyway? No. Okay. We we will stick to one topic at a time. Um, but as you said, this is a this is a voluntary system. Um, Doug, what do you think of the system? Well, I think anything that we can do to get a proper assessment on how well they shatter, how well the paw drop is, to help farmers basically be successful, the bit more the better. Um, every company is out there trying to strive to produce the best possible hybrid. There's a lot of good hybrids out there. It's just the shatter slash straight. Now, it, people have straight cut for years, but it's how you manage it. What ideally is that if we have this scoring system, it's just going to allow farmers to make better informed decisions based upon what they have for straight cut power, for swathing power. The one thing, though, we have to point out is that harvest loss is harvest loss. It's just that there is a loss at swathing. There is a loss at straight cutting. Uh, it's just that we, if we are going to straight cut, we want to minimize crop loss itself. But you will still get mm -hmm. some loss from the actual combine, you know, going through the, the field. So the whole idea is that everybody's striving to get that, and I think it's a great idea. And it'll help mm -hmm. customers make that better decision. Mm -hmm. um, I'm... Writing down notes, Doug, because I do this show every week and I always need new <laughs> ideas. And harvest losses, managing harvest losses, isn't necessarily one we've done in a while. So, uh, so there you go. All right. So I do want to get into some of the specifics of actually making that, as you said, a game day decision. Talk talk about you know staging a crop and deciding exactly you know when when to pull the trigger into swath. So I'm going to throw to this is a video, Sean, of your boss in 2013. Um, so going back into the archives for this canola school with Clint Yerke. Uh So producer Kara, if you could run that clip and then we'll talk about staging a canola crop for swathing. So this particular crop actually looks quite uniform. So this one's going to be a little bit easier, uh, but the...
So this particular crop actually looks quite uniform, so this one's going to be a little bit easier. Um, but the, the basics are that you want to check a few different areas within, your, within the canola crop to make sure that you are getting a, a, a good sample across the entire field. Make sure that you're not missing any uh, low spots, high spots that might be of different maturity. Try to select areas that are going to be representative. So we're going to take a look at this one right near the field entry point to see, uh, to see how this one is coming along for maturity. So when you're sampling a canola crop, uh, best thing to do is, is when you walk in is, is to grab five, six, seven plants that you think are fairly representative of that sample that you want to make. So we'll take a couple right now. Ground is a little hard here. So we've got a few plants here. Now the time that we are looking at, this is a little bit early to be making any swathing decisions, but if you do want to uh, to get out and do some scouting, this is essentially what you want to do. As you take your canola plant that you have and try to find the, the main raceme. Usually with most canola plants, the main raceme, the first flowering branch is, is going to have the majority of the yield. So that's always going to be the, the most central one. So the easiest way to find the most central one is to bend down the, the secondary branches first. And here you're left with the main raceme. And to determine uh, whether or not you're ready to swath this is uh, you need to do uh, sample pods from three different parts of the uh, of the raceme, so the bottom, middle, and top components. And then what we want to do is you need to zoom in on this. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is just to break these pods open and take a look at the seeds that are that are in here. Like I said, this is uh, this is not the appropriate stage to be doing your swath timing, but if you were in, this, in the field to do that, you want to look at the number of seeds that have actually changed color. To do that is any one of these seeds that show any amount of browning on it would be considered to be one seed that has changed color. The, uh, the threshold for making, uh, to actually swath is 60% uh, seed color change. So 60% is, is the optimal time to, to swath a canola crop if you are going to be uh, swathing it. Um, the long-term data that has been generated on the different times or stages that you can swath a crop, 60% has consistently come out as achieving the highest uh, levels of yield consistently. We got, we got this, this producer Kara. It's, it's a little stutter step, but we got there. All right, so um, that, that of course, was our Canola School. And a quick shout out to our show sponsors, Canola School being one of them. Uh, so the Mind Your Farm Business podcast, Adam McKenna, and our Canola School. Canola School, of course, has all our canola-focused agronomic content. Um, we have years' worth of agronomic content. Um, <laughs> Oh my god, Kara. Okay. Um, and of course, thanks to our Canola School sponsor, Invigor Hybrid Canola by BASF. Okay, and special shout out to Paisley. Uh, he, he did not know I was going to do that, but there you go. Hello, Paisley. Thank you for watching. He watches every single episode, um, but never comments. And I kind of wish you would. Okay, back to our swath timing decision. Love that 2013 video with Clint. Yes, it was a little early, but I gotta ask Sean, do we still use seed color change? Ah! So this particular crop actually looks quite We're going back to the three, there we go. There's, so everyone, just so you know, <laughs> Says, I feel like I'm in the Disney teacup ride after six tequilas. <laughs> One would be enough, Ray. One would be enough in there. Okay. Um, we just, there's, when we switch screens, we're still learning things. Okay. So, but Sean, are we still at that seed color change? Do we still, still gauge it the same way? I mean, we are talking 10 years ago. Have we changed our opinion on how we time swathing canola? No, but it's interesting. Like um, we weren't pushing um, swath timing that well because you know, ten years ago it seemed to be everybody was on board. But we did a survey last year, and we found over half of growers were actually going before the six percent. So a big campaign this year was to get growers back to, we say sixty percent or later. There's really no um, reason that you have to hurry at, at sixty. And, and one of the reasons is um, fields are variable, right? So it's mm -hmm. you might find a spot that's sixty, but um, uh, one of the interesting things I learned from a grower um, with a really 
good operator was when he said he first got his yield monitors. You know, he'd go out there, he'd be combining, and he'd go into a low spot and be, oh, there's going to be, you know, great yield here. And he realized, no, I cut it too soon, and, you know, I've actually lost some yield in those areas. So you usually don't want to be walking around that lodged heavy canola. So um, it's you, you want to make sure that you're, you're you're going into those areas, finding multiple areas, and, and not being too late. And, and now with the pod shatter, you know, you'd, it used to be a concern, like 60 much past that, you start to lose yield, start to have some shatter. Um, you know, now you can actually let it stand a little bit longer and, um, you know, let all the mature areas mature. So, so that's great point, Sean. So, and, and Doug, I'll ask you, so map it out for us. So the risk really is going in too early. So why is going too early a concern? And as Sean points out, because we've got, you know, perhaps some better shatter resistance, leaving it a little later is okay. But why, why that sort of timing, what happens if well, we're too early? Well, I think going too early, number one, you can shrivel green seed. You can lock in green seed. Um, typically, a good sign that you hit it too early is that after a couple, three weeks in the field and you're combining, seed's red. Still shows up these days, and you can actually tell the guys are gotten too early. Um, the 60%, uh, just to go back because I have some age on me, uh, I was one of the part of the team that developed that 60% number. And... Mm -hmm. To be blunt, guys, I'm not following that as much as I used to be as far as main stem. I look at 60% whole plant. And so the reasoning is, is that guys are going to lower seeding rates. They're going to lower plant populations, about six to eight plants. Most of that uh, was developed at eight to 10 to 12 plants per square foot. So there wasn't much branching. And then if you take a look at the newer hybrids, especially the ones with straight cut or shatter, higher shatter score, it's a very multi-branch plant. And when you look back at the work that was done by Angadi and even Neil Harker, uh, when they did the research work on the lower plant populations, the actual yield on the main stem is actually not as critical as it is on the side branches. So with a lot of the customers that I deal with that they say, hey, is it time to swath? Typically, I'm 80 to 90% seed color change on the main stem. Um, and I am sampling usually pods from first pod to the middle of the the main stem looking for seed color change because what we're seeing in some of the newer hybrids is that you'll have color change on the first pod and then the second pod has hardly any hardly any and so you get to third and fourth mm -hmm. so for me it's a whole plant approach now i find it's a lot more successful and it's just because of the way the hybrids have gone is into a more of a branchy basket type um okay. but when it comes down to is that we're going into the next couple of weeks i know in alberta we're going to be warm uh, we mm -hmm. definitely want to be on that later side because those side branches have a lot of seed this year and they're still basically very translucent. I was in a field this afternoon where the seeds are firm to roll on the main stem about halfway up and all the way up on those pods, but the seed, side branches are so translucent, they're probably at least three to four weeks away before being ready. So color change will be a little bit later on that main stem. Okay, so and that I guess that's one of my next questions. Um, Sean, when you're if we're looking at, you know, the timing it takes, is it driven just by heat? Is it a just days? How do we sort of gauge how much time you have to sort of wait and go back and check? It should be should you be checking every week? What what should you be doing? Yeah, I mean, you, you check initially, then you, you know, it's it can be, um, you know, 10% in two days if it's if the conditions are right. Um, and it's, you know, just mm -hmm. depends on, you know, we get really cool, um, cloudy, you know, rainy conditions, it might take a bit longer and, and uh, not the change. But um, yeah, once you, you know, you keep going to get close to that um, 60% or later, or and like uh, Doug mentioned, you know, really checking those side branches because um, that's uh, a lot of the yield. We just came out of a combine college in uh, Manitoba, and that was one of the points. You, you initially lose 10% because, um, or up to, you know, you lose 10% just due to shrinkage. But then trying to combine that, trying to set a combine for those tiny little seeds that, you know, are, are smaller and lighter, mm -hmm. it's even harder to set the combine. So you're probably losing again out the back of the combine. So, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's important to be in there checking uh, multiple times. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and I think, I mean, you've both mentioned you know, the, the choosing a good candidate for straight cutting versus swathing. So, so a crop that's well knit, um, and, and Doug, you've mentioned the, the difference in say plant stand counts, those sorts of things. So variability is one of the things we have to take into account, of course, but as you said, so that plant architecture, right? So how branched, how variable, those sorts of things. So Sean, if I'm looking at a field that 
that is quite variable. Um, and, and we definitely saw that. I mean, I don't want to even hearken to last year with the zombie canola that we talked about uh, that came back to life. But definitely this year, you know, if if there was a reseed or if there was, you know, those sorts of things or you've got low spots or you had drown outs, those sorts of things. How do you make that call as far as staging that field when you've got that variability? Oh, we lost Sean. So, Doug, I'll ask you. <laughs> and then we'll go back to Sean. How, well, how do we adjust for variability? Well, the, to so I guess it's ultimately is still the producer's decision. Uh, it's whatever he's willing to risk. What's his swathing horsepower? Does he have an, uh, an auger header? Like what a draper header? So what is his capacity? Um, last year we had guys that they were suggesting swath down and they decided to go. I suggested straight, but I left it up and they took it straight because they just couldn't risk having that crop being at different stages because of the way prices were, contracts had to be filled. So for me, it's a matter of what is a producer comfortable with? If he wants to leave it for straight, the thing that I keep saying to every producer is, are you going to be able to sleep at night? Because if you're not sleeping at night and you're worried about it day by day by day, and it's really dragging on you, then you got to look at, okay, maybe I'm going to, maybe I'm going to take it and put it into into a a swath. swath. As As long as you have the stubble stubble to anchor anchor to it. Um, right. it, it is, is a, a tough, tough call. call. When you have yeah, variable, variable stages, stages, it's a it's very, very tough, tough call. call. You, you can show the different, different and, and discuss the different, different options that are available and what you can do. do. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, you don't, you don't get, get a section of the field that's all a week behind and another section that's, you know, five days behind and another one's perfect, which would be beautiful. But in the real world, it's a half an acre here and a half an acre there. And now now you got to figure out what you got to do. Now, the other thing that throws into this is swathing horsepower. And or straight, straight cutting horsepower. horsepower. Can you get to it in a timely fashion and not let your other crop suffer? And some guys will make decisions based on the fact I've got 2,500 acres to knock down. So I'm going to go do all of that and I'm going to come back and get that variable field and take shelling on the late, on the earlier stuff so I can capture the other. So, you know, there's a pile of scenarios out here. So you did mention, I know Sean, you dropped out there and missed some of that, but uh, you, I think you caught the part, you did mention having stubble to hold it there. So there is the risk, of course, if you swath it, that it ends up in the fence line. So, so how do we manage sort of, so in that, in that vein, Sean, how do you manage that variability? How do you manage the risk of, of losses? Uh, leaving it standing or putting it in a swap? That's always a tough question. Like it's, you know, what you would consider an ideal um, straight cut field is a lodged knit crop, um, you know, with a, a really good, um, it, it'll move all at once, right? So you get the, the scraggler fields, um, but they're not as suited for straight cutting, but they're also not usually as straight suited for swathing because they tend to be a bit shorter and not as much stubble in them. So. Um, it's never an easy decision. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of how long is it going to sit out there if I swath it? Um, you know, what, uh, what are the conditions like? It's, there's no black and white to it. it it's really um, every grower, um, his own decision. And, you know, like Doug mentioned, it sometimes just fits into your crop, what you've got for crops. You know, I'm going to be gone for two weeks trying to get my wheat off in good condition. So what's my best choice for that kind of crop that's going to be sitting out there? Mm-hmm. Now I have, there are two questions. Uh, Jason, it's like you're reading my mind. Uh, we're going to talk desiccation for a bit, but there's, there's a few other things. One that always comes up. Um, and so we'll, maybe we'll talk desiccating first and then I'll move to those other ones. But um, yes. So when you're talking, if you're going to decide to go the desiccation route, um, what is that ideal timing? Sean, I'll start with you. It depends on what product you're using. Like, um, you know, there's, there's not really desiccation, but like pre-harvest glyphosate, the label is 30% seed moisture. But that works out to around that 60 to 70% um, seed color change, just the, just like swath timing. You know, heat and glyphosate, um, I believe it's 80% seed color change now, and um, Reglone, 90% brown seed. So you know, each one of those products have different, um, uh, how fast they, the activity is on them. And, uh, you know, like something like regular, you got to be really careful. Um, if you contact really quick, you're too early on it, then you can lock in and see pretty easy. So, but all of them, you got to be, make sure you're, 
on that proper time. I mean, it can be tough in the variable fields. Um, you really have to you know, wait for that um, later staging, uh, that last stage of control to come around. I do want to just a quick shout out to all of all of our Eastern Canada viewers. A, a swather. No, I'm just kidding. I think they know what a swather is, although there aren't that many around here. Um, but also heat is Aragon. So in Ontario, in Ontario, it's called Aragon out west. It's called heat. Same product. Uh, but there you go. We lost Sean again, but he's done his part. So, Doug, you're up again. Um, OK, so so let's talk. Um, unless you want to add to the desiccation, there is a second part to that aerial versus ground applied. Do you have any uh, any tips on the desiccation decision, aerial versus ground? Uh, it all depends upon availability and time. We do have some guys that are aerial applicating. However, they are restricted to the herbicides they can use. Most of the guys in our area that are straight cutting are actually ground raking. And the reason being is that they're putting on a little bit higher water volumes, they're using a lot of pressure, they're getting into the canopy, so they actually kill the plant. As canola gets a little bit older, gets a thicker waxy cuticle or cuticle layer on the pods and everything else a little bit later on, it's a little bit tougher to absorb. So you want to get it into that canopy so that plant gets that good absorption and it helps speed up that process. Um, some years it really works well, the desiccation process, but we've had the odd year here where 20 days later, nothing's still happening. And that's just because that waxy layer was so thick and nothing got penetrated. And But the desiccation is a nice way to even out other than mother nature. A good minus seven for about eight hours will straighten out and desiccate a crop perfectly. But we don't want to see that till October. Well, I'm, so that was one of my other questions is what we also hear is if we have a earlier than wanted frost, do you run out and swath? Or... No. Okay. Why not? It, 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 minimum it. three. It's, it's minimum it. three days before you even make that assessment, unless. So, if you've got a relatively green crop, uh, if you've got a relatively heavy canopy, typically the frost is only on the top part of the canopy. You'll typically get inside there. It never does get that cold. The only time we've really had to swath that same day. Uh, we were into, and this was about three years ago, it was like minus five for about four hours and it was a really green crop and he had to swath because it was shelling pods within six hours after the sun came up. But my recommendation has been for everybody is that you get a one or two degree frost and it's for half an hour, hour, go check it, take a look at it, make it appease yourself and then leave it. Let, let her buck, let mother nature take care of it. And we typically find that if you allow that plant to continue on you don't see as much green seed issues showing up uh typically the risk is is that if you do knock it down right over swath you could actually lock in green seed that the plant could have potentially cleared because the seed wasn't damaged so the attitude has always been like minus one minus two go look at it and then like i tell john gully go fish for a couple of days <laughs> he does like to fish sean are you are you on side with that you think uh go fishing and just wait yeah, especially I mean, if you, you know, some people actually go swapping in the forecast, you, you, you never trust the weather forecast. Like, in, or you don't know what's going to happen, right? So, you know, for sure, wait to see what happens. Um, don't be out there because you know, it says in two days we're going to see a, a heavy frost. So, when up and swap it, um, that changes so quick. So, yeah, no wait and see. That, yeah, absolutely. Um, good and point. I, to add to that, Lindsay, I was just going to mention is that if you get that say rain. Uh, half an inch, two tenths, three inches of rain, and you get cooler conditions, then all of a sudden a frost, the water will actually act like the, it'll take the hit for you. And we've seen that before is where rain will actually take the hit on a frost, and you never do see those issues. So, but it's a field by field comparison, and you get, of course, your hilltops, your lowlands will always get hit, but there's a lot of factors involved. You just don't jump on the swath and away you go. All right, now we do, I do want to talk about late season scouting, um, at least briefly, and, and we're, we're rapidly approaching the end of the show here, uh, which has flown by. So, so the other, but I do want to talk about this, the other end of the spectrum, of course, is uh, heat, the heat of the day. So Doug, you've got a visual here. So is there an ideal time to swath a canola crop? Well, for temperature wise, I don't want anything over 25. Um, ideally, even with a good humidity, the crop just gets too hot. And if you'll show a picture of a swath there I took, 
Uh, I don't know if she'll pop it up for us. Yeah, producer Kara, please don't start yeah. the countdown. We just want the picture. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you can you can unmute and tell me to go to yeah. H E Double Hawk. So <laughs> so what I did here, I don't know if she'll show it, but uh, anyways, long story short. Um, nope. Next. Go through. Next. It's the one of the swat. There, ah, we that one there. there we go. There we go. Perfect. Yep, that's okay. Great. So this was a gentleman that it was 29, 28 degrees Celsius, and he was swathing during the heat of the day. So what I did is I took an infrared gun and I got him to hold off swathing till it hit about 24, 23 degrees Celsius in the evening. And I went back the next day at two o'clock in the afternoon and the outside of the swath actually was close to 30 degrees Celsius. When I went in underneath, and I took the temperature, the ambient air temperature with this infrared gun in the soil and on the stems underneath the swath, it was down to 14 degrees, which was the overnight temp. So it was interesting is that when it was all said and done, he had locked in green seed on the 30 degree swath days when he was swathing during the day and was 30. He locked in about five to 6% greens. And when he was swathing at night, he had zeros. And what it basically did is it allowed that plant to basically shut down, although the stomata openings doesn't really clear, shut down completely, but it doesn't desiccate it like a hay. So to me, it's below 25 is you want to swath. Now, if it's 24 and you've got good humidity and they're calling cool nights, keep going. But when we're supposed to hit like 29 and 30 here this week, which I hope nobody's swathing yet, those are the wrong temperatures to be going. And it's also understanding what is color change at the right time. Right. So. Okay. So, so, and Sean, that's one question or that's one thing that, that I know experienced growers know this, but I think it's worth mentioning the importance of make, making sure we're gauging seed color change, not pod color change. Because why, and why is that important? Why does the pod not tell the story the seed does? Well, there's lots of reasons. Some varieties just have a different, um, the way the, um, the pod color changes. It could be different environmental conditions. Sun scald, and they look really turned and, um, and brown, but it's um, you know just like a sunburn on the on the plant. Um, really, it it doesn't correlate well to what's in the pod, what's on the outside of the pod. So you you have to actually in both ways. I see browner pods with green seed. I see greener pods with brown seed. So um, yeah, there's just no there's no correlation. But you you really need to open the pods up to see what you've got for for seed color change. Okay, absolutely. absolutely. Um, now, 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 Ray, of course, is congratulating our Eastern audience for hanging in here on a, a very Western topic um, and did did mention perhaps some winter canola discussion. So I will say, so Peter Johnson couldn't uh, join the chat tonight. He's at a meeting, uh, but he put in a request actually for a winter canola episode. So I'll see if I can get it done um, sometime in August. Uh, winter canola is not a thing in Western Canada, but Spring planted canola isn't a huge thing in Ontario, but definitely a lot of interest um, in canola in general. But uh, as a fun sidebar, Sean or Doug, have you seen any work with winter canola out west? Was that like a 10 year, 20 year thing? Where are we at? <laughs> what, 15 years ago? Um, okay. It, actually, what survived actually made a crop. But one plant for every five square feet didn't exactly help. But the problem that we have in Western Canada with winter canola is we need the moisture in the fall time to get the crop out of the ground so it can vernalize. And typically Western Canada, we're dry. And so we had one year where we actually had good moisture, was able to get to a certain stage before um, the, the frost got it, was able to overwinter, but then a spring frost got it. So, you know, we just don't have the weather here for it. It's, uh, I wish we had Ontario weather in some respects, but it's, it's, it's a spring canola season out here. Yeah, absolutely. And Doug, uh, as someone who is someone who grew up in Manitoba, but now lives in Ontario, there are definitely aspects. I would switch between the two. Um, okay, so now is, we're, we are rolling towards the end here and I do have a clip, but I, I don't think I'm gonna run it actually, Producer Kara, because I think if I run that, we're gonna run out of time. But I don't want to talk about swath timing or straight cutting without talking about the opportunity that this that time of year, because we're a little early yet, but what else you could be doing after the swather or after you harvest 
um, what things you can also be looking for. And Doug, you've mentioned sort of a disease riddled crop in that decision, but Sean, I'll start with you. What do you encourage growers to be looking for absolutely either from the swather or from the combine um, when it comes to assessments you can make uh, late in the season on that canola crop? Well, the, the swather is actually a really good timing for um, looking at, you can pull the plants, you know, look at the root, you can see your club root, same time, cut the stem, uh, take a look at the cross section, the black leg, and also look for sclerotinia on the um, on the upper part of the plant. So it, it's a really good time. Um, you know what, straight cutting still is okay, but the, the longer that plant sits out there and dries down, the more um, other um, things we have to move in and, and cause black lesions and stuff like that, the plant and kind of mix that up and, and uh, obscure um, our assessments. Mm -hmm. Doug, what about for you? What is What are some of the, the favorite things that you're looking for at uh, Well, Well, actually it starts a little bit before. I, I have a few people that I work, uh, customers slash farmers that I work closely with. They actually have a side-by-side -side and we go crop scouting at this time. Uh, we're looking for ligus bugs. Ligus bugs are now in the crop. We're seeing some damage out there. And the reason we we'll want to look at it now is that we're still early in pod fill. The pods are very pliable because after the pods get a little bit tough, it is uh, basically revenge spraying, you know, and we're hurting the beneficials. But what I like to do at the swathing time or just prior to swathing time, I want to go find out what those dead patches are. Being that I live in Club Root Central or along the edge of Club Root Central, we want to get out and find out was that Club Root or Sclerotinia. But I also want to find out too how my plant populations are doing. And so typically within straight cutting or swathing, this is a great opportunity to take out that hula hoop or a ro uh, meter rule or whatever you want to do and start look at your plant counts and look at your survivability based upon your seeding rates. Because I think that gives you a better idea based on the year, how things have gone to make decisions for next year, because we're already starting to get into next year country, even though we haven't started a combine yet. But I need to know, did I get 80% survivability? Did I get 60? Did I do 90? What did I do right? What did I do wrong? It's sort of a season long assessment. What do my pods look like? You know, there's a lot of things I like to do from the swather and that's including what am I doing for plant populations? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, now, Sean, we, we have seen uh, in Manitoba, I don't think it's in Saskatchewan, but let me know, uh, verticillium wilt and that is one that you should be assessing for if you're in those areas. So who needs to know um, that they should be looking for and identifying what the different stem lesions are? What areas? It's mainly Manitoba. We've seen, I think there's been some in Eastern Saskatchewan. That would be a Warren question. I have to double check, but um, definitely in the, the Manitoba area. Um, and it, it's the, the highlight difference really is it affects about half the, um, the stem. So, you know, to not compete with something like um, sclerotinia, um, it'll be um, half that stem. When you cut it, you'll see the, actually the black stripes. Um, that's why um, the verticillium stripe um, idea behind it. So, Okay, so that for sure. Um, and Doug mentioned the dreaded club root. Where are we at with testing for uh, club root? Uh, Sean, you're in, in Saskatchewan, which of course it's been found in several different areas, but what is the surveillance uh, right now, what's the recommendation for growers if they suspect they've got club root issues? I uh, do definitely take a sample. You suspect it, or if you're just in a high risk area with anything that's been done, you know, any um, land work coming through, construction, you know, oil fields, anything like that that's um, moved soil into the field. But also, just it's good to take a test every every so often to, to check. Um, Saskatoon will actually um, sponsor some testing of that, uh, both club root and black leg. So if you know, growers want to do it, it's um, you get a hold of Saskatoon and they'll uh, get you the, uh, the supplies for it. Okay, absolutely. Um, although that is a question, I know later in the season, if we're talking, you know, a, a after harvest, um, sometimes those club root galls can have can disappear. So when would be, like Doug mentioned, assessing those dead patches, so figuring out why we've got dead plants, when is actually the best time to be digging up plants to look for club root galls? Is that myself or Doug you're asking? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'll ask you and then, okay. well. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, uh, you know, it's it, like Doug mentioned, we're really looking for those dead areas. So, I mean, that's, um, you know, you, you really need to know why are those dead areas out there. So really any time in the season, 
Um, it kind of depends on what, how much moisture you've got, what the growing conditions have been like on, and how fast the disease will progress. But, um, you know, you tend to see it more in the later season. That's when you can actually see those club, club root um, galls larger and, and easier to find. But, you know, anytime you've got something weird going on, um, wilting plants, dying plants, um, get in there, pull them and, and double check. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, okay, I've got another question for you, Doug, but before I do that, uh, I do want to send out one last shout out to our show sponsors, of course, to uh, the Canola School and Adama Canada, but also the Mind Your Farm Business podcast. We had a brand new episode go up uh, this morning on realagriculture.com, or you can go to mindyourfarmbusiness.com. Uh, today's episode, the latest episode, is on personality assessments and how they can help you have a better work culture and farm team. And it's a it's a really good one. Todd Miller is the person who's interviewed. He came to work with the Real Agriculture team um, and really fantastic uh, stuff. So give that a listen. Uh, you can download it from the site or anywhere you get your podcasts. Okay, uh, question then for Doug, uh, keeping on the swath timing uh, slash harvest timing scouting. I do want to talk about Black Lake a little bit. So, you are, of course, in clubroot country. Clubroot, I'm going to guess, is the bigger concern, but black leg is always a concern. So how important is it to be, to be pulling stems, snipping stems, and getting a handle on, on black leg in your fields as well? Well, it's going to be very important, Lindsay, because you have to understand your total disease package. We do know that black leg is prevalent throughout Western Canada. Some areas you do see a little bit more because of tighter rotations and or things that are going on. Uh, we're typically been seeing the last couple of years in areas where early flea beetle feeding, um, some early season hailstorms has basically helped with the black leg. Uh, as far as not helped with the black leg, it has caused more black leg. Uh, the thing that happens though is that because of adult plant resistance, seedling disease resistance, we do see it, but you need to understand what's going on. So that's pulling plants, cutting the stems, look for the black fingers. And you will actually see in some areas we have seen actually where black leg has been the killer of the canola crop. It hasn't been the club root as we suspected. Um, going back to Sean's talk about club root sampling, you will actually see the late flower where if especially under a lot of heat, you'll find areas that are wilty looking and everything else and you can pull it up, you can find club root goals. They are affecting early. So any, like Sean said, any time is a good time to scout for club root. And the interesting part is, is that once you get a golf form, that means you're putting spores back in. So the nice thing about club root resistance, you, although it's not immune, uh, it allows, uh, it does minimize the amount of spores it's putting back in the soil. But the majority of plants will not have a gall, but you still see the odd plant may have one. Uh, but it's nothing to get alarmed about. The whole idea is, is that if you have not deployed club root resistance in your fields yet, you need to, because one thing that's always been found, and then um, even when I was with the Canola Council, everybody deploys a year too late. So if you haven't already deployed club root resistance, get that into your farm rotation, for sure. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, and if we haven't terrified all the Easterners yet, um, we, could, we could just keep talking about all the diseases and all of the insects that love to chew on canola. Um, it's okay if it's new to an area, you've got lots of time, it'll be fine. It's like when soybeans moved west. It was, you know, the one most wonderful crop because nothing impacted it yet. But then all the pests show up. So there you go. Um, yes, so, so very quickly though, Doug, you did mention ligus feeding. Um, we are a little ahead, of course, of swath timing. So, Sean, what else, uh, just quickly, what else could farmers be looking for when they start to do that initial scout? Are, are there any insects of concern that uh, farmers should be paying attention to? Well, I mean, I'm actually doing grasshoppers this year, so, um, you know, um, there's no to do at that point for um, pre harvest intervals, but. Um, you know, they will eat anything green even in a swath, so um, you, know, you want to be scouting before that point uh, to know what you've got out there. Um, and Doug put a really good point on the, um, the plant counts. Um, that's one of our, our campaigns out right now is making sure you're out there and counting plants. Um, you know, right back to the, this whole swathing, looking for um, you know maturity, it's way easier on an even crop. So um, you know knowing what you, you need to do to get that even crop. So it's a little game um, one. You know, the disease we mentioned. Um, and then the plant counts. Yeah. Um, yeah, grasshoppers are an interesting one. And actually, and Sean, you mentioned pre-harvest intervals. 
I'm so glad you did. And this is my PSA for everyone to remember. A pre-harvest interval is from when you spray to when you cut, not when you harvest, right? Yes, yeah, when you remove that plant from the ground, I guess, when you make that cut. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. any of your insecticides, herbicides, um, fungicides, you know, there's, there's, we got spray to swath.ca. It's really good. Go in there and, you know, make sure you've left that proper timeline to, to um, yeah. uh, be safe. There's other, one other bug, Lindsay, I'd like to add, and that's diamondback moth larvae. Uh, they are out, and we are seeing them. And right now on the sort of the mid-seeded crops, it's about playing the, uh, right into the game of the larvae, is that the moth laying flight was about 10 days ago, maybe a little bit earlier. And so the larvae are starting to hatch, and it started coming right about the same time that the lower leaves will start to nesting. So they'll quickly move up onto the pods. And what the damage they do is they skin the pods. And it's not so much that they attack the seed, but it's the actual drying down the pods that causes massive shelling. Uh, when I was Sean's age, working for the Canola Council in Western Saskatchewan, I saw a field that turned from green to white in a matter of a day. So it's something the guys need to stay on top of. So it's a matter of, there is on the Canola Council website how to sample for them, but stay ahead of that one because it can sneak up on you. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great comment. Um, Doug, I think you're trying to tell us you're much older than you are. But uh, uh, we'll <laughs> I got called senior agronomist the other day and I just won't flip the oh, lid. did you? But, yeah. Oh, but that means you get all the discounts at the restaurants. So it's oh, No, fine. I don't get, I'm not that old. I may look, oh, it, but I'm not that I can't, old. I can't wait, I can't wait to do that. Anyway. Um, all right. Okay. We are, we are out of time. Uh, thank you both. Thank you to Sean and to Doug. Thanks very much for joining us. I know we had a few hiccups with tonight's uh, broadcast, but I really appreciate both of you sharing your time and your expertise with us. And uh, let's hope, fingers crossed, uh, that we don't have to have any of those panic moments of running out to go swath. Uh, because we get the dreaded F word. Um, but great tips from both of you. Thank you so much for other things you should be looking for and spending time on. So I really appreciate that. And yes, uh, a shout out to everyone in the comments who's following along tonight. Um, for Even for those of you in the East who uh, maybe don't grow canola or may grow winter canola, uh, still a really fascinating crop. So thank you, Sean. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Alrighty, and of course we are back next week uh, for the agronomist Mondays 8 p.m. Eastern. I, I think next week we're actually going to focus on some insects. We're going to talk uh, wheat midge and uh, wheat stem soft flies. So don't miss that. Uh, that'll be a really cool one. Of course, head on over to realagriculture.com/agronomist to collect those CEU credits. And a huge thank you to our show sponsors for making this all happen. The Mind Your Farm Business podcast, Adam Canada, and the Canola School. Uh, and thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. And big shout out to producer Kara. Uh, we did it. Yay. Okay. Have a great week, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.